Detroit Police Department just completed a comprehensive analysis of the 386 criminal homicides recorded in the city last year. A close examination of these crimes underscores the need for better conflict resolution efforts in our neighborhoods, and it calls attention to the high number of African American males who are dying in urban cities. Detroit Police Department data show almost half of the city's homicide victims knew their assailants. In fact, for the past three years, an average of 45 percent of homicides involved a victim and a perpetrator who were acquainted. Anger or arguments were the motives for 37 percent of the city's murders last year, indicating the need for nonviolent conflict resolution in troubled neighborhoods. And 78 percent of homicide victims last year were black males. Black females comprise the next largest group at almost 11 percent. These homicide trends are being duplicated in cities across America, so they're not just here in Detroit. Joining me to talk about this data are Inspector Dwayne Blackman, Commanding Officer of the Detroit Homicide Unit, and Dr. Carl S. Taylor, Professor of Sociology at Michigan State University. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. This is obviously a very serious issue. We heard the mayor this week talk some about uh, two uh, in, in two ways. One, how he wants to reorganize the police department to, to get more officers on the street, thinking that that will help. But also, he talked a lot about how this is not just a police uh, problem. He talked about the, the, the number of people uh, who are involved in these homicides who know each other, and that that, that, that points to uh, a more community uh, issue that doesn't really have to do with, with police. Yeah, absolutely. What the mayor is trying to get individuals to understand is that it's a, it's a holistic problem. You know, the police play a role in this, right? but it requires individuals to realize that they are preying upon themselves. It's within the neighborhoods. These are individuals that may not have as much as the other person who's, who's actually perpetrating. Right. So what the mayor wants them to understand and what we're, we're asking them to understand is the fact that look upon yourself as a solution and not just the police department. And, and what would that mean? I mean, if I if I live in a neighborhood over on the east side where where you know it's it's really the the sort of near east and west sides where we see the highest concentration uh, of these murders every year. If I'm living on a block on on one of those streets, uh, what what is it that you think I could do uh, to help help fight this problem, but also to help the police? Well, you know, problem? there's there's this no snitch attitude sure. that's within the neighborhood. Right. And one of the problems that I, I definitely understand is that there's a their fear of retaliation. Right. But the problem that when you when you don't snitch or, or excuse me, when I won't even use terminology <laughs> snitch. Right. But when you don't give the information that's necessary to get that perpetrator in custody, he's capable of per perpetrating more throughout the neighborhood. Right. So what you're actually allowing to happen is that you're allowing more crime to continue. And one of the things the police, the police are only as good as their community who provide that information. And so if, if, if the community is going to help itself, it has to police itself also. It has to realize that the information that you have is important to get that perpetrator off the street so that he doesn't continue to uh, prey upon others in the neighborhood. Right. Uh, Dr. Taylor, you've spent an awful long time uh, thinking and writing and speaking about uh, uh, this culture of violence and, and, and sort of what drives it. Uh, t uh, tell me as somebody who, as we were talking b before the show, a lifelong Detroiter, uh, all three of us in fact are, right. are, are lifelong Detroiters uh, or, or were born here at least, uh, tell me is there something about Detroit that makes it different from other cities when we, where we see this, or is this just uh, uh, an urban quote-unquote problem uh, that you'd find anywhere? Well, I think there's no question that it is an urban problem, that what we see in Detroit, even look at the president's uh, home of Chicago sure. on the south side, that we're having a tremendous amount of violence and homicide there. So it's an urban problem. Detroit is unique because we may be the leader because I can go all the way back uh, before the riots, but once the riot took place in 1967, those social levees burst. Sure. And we saw things from, we're a hard blue collar town, working class, but along with that comes uh, the values uh, that the black community brought from the South, which are really our base, our anchor, those black Christian social values. Sure. And we have uh, run afoul 
we're not looking at that. So a lot of the things that we are asking from people, quite frankly, they have not been socialized. And while this is a confrontation of authority and police, this really is about socialization, you know, a lack of civility right. and also a lack of education. We see a system that is not so much concerned with defending the individual as defending the prerogatives of the state and making certain that the state has a monopoly on the weapons, that the citizens are disarmed, not so much as a means of preventing the citizens from eliminating each other, but as a means of keeping the citizens from eliminating the government that rules over them. We must be aware of the European who discusses a lot of social issues in terms of individual behavior, such as we don't want people out there taking the law in their own hands. It is the police that takes the law in their own hands. When the police engage in racial discrimination, when the policeman beats, shoots, destroys, or eliminates our people in the streets, it is the police who are taking the law in their own hands, not the people themselves. It is the police who are the vigilantes for the establishment and for maintaining the status quo. The situation is reversed. It is the police then who have the means of holding people hostage in jails and in prisons and who harass our people and who lock our people in dungeons and who exercise penalties and terror. Who is going to guard the guardians of our so-called law? We see the law then may not be, we see the law then may not be the problem. It is the execution of the law. We see the law used as a means of repression and dissent. The police are used as a means of maintaining the, show, the social status quo and social order, not so much when a person is purportedly dis disturbing the peace, but where a person threatens to disturb the social, the social system itself. Police officers often see Americanism as being equivalent to capitalism, that one cannot be American if one is not also capitalist, and therefore to be anti-capitalist is to be anti-American. To be for a different system of distributing the wealth of the nation, which belongs to the nation, is to be anti-American. To concern oneself with a more equitable means of distributing justice and freedom. To question the current system of inequality. To be perceived as un-American and a threat to national security is to be made fair game for repression and denial of the democratic rights that are supposedly guaranteed by the Constitution. We see that often the only crime of many people, such as the eight, is to think in different terms and to talk about different types of people of arrangement of social relations. But that speech and that thought laid the basis for their very rights to be taken away from them, the right to bail and other rights. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Welcome back to Own the Shoulders of Giants. I am Joseph Ward. If this is your first time, welcome. I am continuing my reading of Dr. Amos Wilson's The Falsification of African Consciousness, Eurocentric History, Psychiatry, and Politics of White Supremacy. And I'm reading from pages 80, from the uh, second to last paragraph from page 80 to page, 90, to page 96, or excuse me, well, 97 to page 97. And that's that will end that part two of this book. So, in this book, in this video, rather, we're talking about criminality or criminal profiling or how a criminal is made or how black people are stereotyped as criminals within the system of society that we live in. Um, you saw the statistics that the gentleman had in the video. Of course, this video is not a 2024 video, but at the time, um, I'm not sure the exact year of the video, but at the time you can see the, the crime statistics. Um, and black men had the highest percentage of the crime statistics. So I'm currently engaged in a, um, in a coalition of people right now who are looking at solutions of gun violence here in my city. And one of the things that we're doing so far is gathering statistics and analyzing statistics. And so far, what I've seen here in my own city is, um, the same as you saw in that video when they was looking at Detroit, and that probably was in the 90s, that black men have the highest percentage of violence within the city. Uh, black people, black men. So most of the, when we're looking specifically at gun violence. So black men have the highest rates of gun violence here in Tallahassee, Florida. 
Dr. Amos Wilson's argument is the, the behavior is a result of the programming. In this book, he's, he uses the example of Frankenstein. You know, Frankenstein was the, uh, well, Frankenstein wasn't actually the monster. Frankenstein was the doctor, Dr. Frankenstein. The Frank, Dr. Frankenstein created his monster, who we call Frankenstein. But Dr. Frankenstein took all these different pieces and put this together, but also put this mindset into the monster. He made it a monster. Think about it. We call it a monster. Dr. Frankenstein made it a monster, and then the monster went out doing monstrous things. So using that analogy, white America made the Negro mindset. It created the Negro mindset. It implanted the Negro mindset. It reinforced the Negro mindset. And now the Negro is Negroing, and white America has a problem. So your creation is doing exactly what you created it to do. And now that creation is wreaking havoc. And it is now a problem, but also it is what they're using for the criminal profile of black men, right? So black men, it's, it's the, the notion that black men are inherently violent. We are inherently criminals. Like from, from the womb to the tomb, that's all we know is criminality. And of course, that's not true. The, the, the majority of black men don't even commit crimes, but the majority of crimes of these violent crimes that they're saying are committed are committed by black men. But it is a small percentage of black men, right? But the idea is that black men in itself, what we are as a whole, we are all violent, right? Now, what's interesting about that is the stereotypes and the, the narratives that are implanted that are given to us and constantly, constantly, constantly beating to our heads. Because I was, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, matter of fact, and I was telling them about myself um, internalizing the the criminality, internalizing, internalizing the self-hatred, internalizing all the negative narratives that white, white America, white supremacy gave to us. So when I was young and I used to walk home and young in middle school, and I used to have to walk home after school. There was a second chance school of the of the black and white, and all the at that time it was more black and white. So the black and white boys who weren't the best students, and they were the the problem, the troubled students, and they would send them to this second chance. The school was called Second Chance. There was some portables off in this obscure part of town, and so as I'm walking home, it was always a group of young black men walking toward me, a group of maybe five to seven, maybe 10 walking toward me. And in my mind, at that time, in my mind, because of the programming, I was thinking that they was going to do something to me, right? Oh, man, I have to be afraid that they're going to do something to me. But they never did. They weren't even thinking about me. And that was the craziest part is them gentlemen weren't even thinking about me. They walked by be like, what up, man? I'm like, what up? And in my mind, I'm like, whew. But then as I got older, you know, after that happened about two or three times, you let it go, right? But as I got older and started looking back, but as I started being able to analyze my behavior, my mentality, the way the way I the programming that I have as an individual, but also the collective programming that we have, I started to understand why I thought that way and why I felt that way and why I behaved that way toward my own people. So now when I see a group of black young black boys, I'm not afraid. I'm not thinking of that. I just see a group of young black boys. But I also understand the root of why I thought like that and why people still think like that. It's because of the programming that they've received as well. The idea is that black men are violent. And then it's reinforced by the violent statistics that are not necessarily broken down into context. Remember how I stated earlier, a small percentage of black men, and I'm talking specifically about my city, the statistics that I saw from my city. And we can even throw in what we saw in the video for Detroit. A small percentage of black men are doing a large number of the crimes. But those are a lot of the black men who are more, who may be a lot more maladjusted than the rest of us. Life circumstances, violent altercations, all these different things, um, they're happening. We're not saying that black men are not committing violence, but what we are saying is that we do not have a criminal nature. So let's get into it. Let's let's let Dr. Amos Wilson break it down a little further for us. And I'm picking back up on the last paragraph on page 81. So under the guise of defending democracy, 
the security agencies of our national legal departments are able to deny so-called dissenters and their democratic rights and to move the not move the nation closer to a police state which is exactly what we are seeing here and therefore we see telephones tapped offices raided records and funds of dissent of descendant organizations stolen by the police themselves we see agencies of our law enforcement departments engaged in theft breaking and entering we see agents of the law engaging and threatening the members of non-confronting groups maligning the reputation of those who dare to question the system beating eliminating arresting who dare to question the system i mean beating eliminating arresting and trumpeting and trumping up charges against those who dare to even think out loud or indicate that they are looking at the possibilities of dealing with the tremendous problem we have today we see a system that uses its procedural rights rights to a trial the rights to a jury the rights to go before a grand jury as a means of repression oh the eight may oh the eight may win that case but will they really win that case did angela davis really win her case or was the very process of fighting the charges the years of energy food sweat blood tears the years and the money that went into the defense of angela and others like her the very means of repression expressing itself in the system by the time these individuals get through fighting in the courts that allowed them to be heard before a jury before a jury of their peers the issues and troubles over which they are arrested in the first place often have left them behind or have been destroyed by the very process itself their very arrest and their very going through the procedure even if the procedure is neutral and equal still it intimidates the rest of us and makes the rest of us conform so um i didn't really have time to look all the way into who the eight was but i'm assuming the eight was had was connected with angela davis and other um what we would call our our black rights leaders our black power leaders um political prisoners people who were in jail or jailed because they were fighting against the system so now he's getting into the different means that the government has that we know that we have evidence of the government using in the past to destabilize uh groups of black people who fought for equality and justice and black rights and black liberation so they would tap phones they would like all all of the technological stuff that they had at the time tapping phones um using informants following people um even using the system using um uh arresting people using the court system uh not allowing people bail trumping up charges like dr wilson said doing everything within their power within their grasp to destabilize the freedom fighters not only as he stated not only destabilize the freedom fighters but intimidate anybody else who would want to be a freedom fighter because if you want to be a freedom fighter this is what you're going to have to go through so looking at what happened to fred hampton looking at what happened to mega Evans, looking at what happened to dr king looking at what happened to martin luther king look at what happened to the black panthers themselves looking at what happened to all of the uh political prisoners that we have um mumil abu jamal um asada shakur all of the people who have stood up for us and who have been arrested who have been maligned who have been eliminated in some form or fashion right we don't fight back today the way we fought back then for a reason we've been conditioned to think about the consequences that's why we go about it a, a lot different these days that's why we try to be a lot more democratic and work with the system instead of saying f the system right because we've seen enough of what they've done to us think about when we were either in school or in february when you look at images and videos and 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 learn about the civil rights movement and everything around they always show us the consequences that the black people had to face we're always getting an abundance of consequences that black people had to face the water hoses the dogs the jailings the police beatings all these different um negative things that happen to black people the elimination of black people the lynchings all these things they always show us that and it makes sense to show us that for a reason to reinforce the program that if you try to stand up against the system this is what's going to happen to you so we have a system that may even free us and then congratulates itself oh the system works doesn't it 
but only after a course it works. But it is set up such that in the end, it will still attain its oppressive goals. You have the right to equal housing. The laws say so. We even have agencies that we can complain to about being discriminated against. All of this is set up. We have a right to move into any neighborhood we want to, if we can afford it. Here is the system that grants these rights and simultaneously takes away the very means of fully exercising them. This is a system that uses all types of psycho controls for law and order. Once we are arrested, once we are convicted, our rights are denied. Now we can be subject to electroshock, psychosurgery, etc. Recall that in the 60s, the, dis the dissidents, those who were part of the riot situations, those who protested against the oppression of black people were seen as sick. They were seen as having a problem. And one of the means proposed for dealing with the problem was to cut parts of their brains out, was to go directly into their skulls and lobotomize them because of a diagnosis of illnesses and more than anything else because of a political diagnosis. Some of you saw the Amsterdam news, I believe. It came out on Thursday. Remember, this is this book was published in. This book was published in. Hold on. Well, they have like dates of oh, 1993. This book was published in 93. So, um, so it discusses the experimentation of our people by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I said that like I'm from Memphis. It dis it discusses the experimentation of our people from, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Central Intelligence Agency, agency, and other agencies inside and outside of this country. Even in South Africa and other places, the experimentation on our people is taking place currently and certainly has taken place in the past. We must recognize that this kind of thing contributes, I mean, continues and is part of the so-called law and order system that exists today. So I've been saying this for the longest because I've learned this a while ago. Our social sciences, our sciences, our medical field, our mental health fields, they have their roots in racism. They have the experimentation roots in racism. They would use black people who didn't feel pain. That So they said, said black people didn't feel pain so they can experiment on this. And using all these experimentation, all these horrendous and inhumane experimentation, they figured out what all their tools and all their little experimentations actually do. They figured out all the outcomes. Now they use them and then they continue to use them. So black people who are caught up in the system a subject to having all of their rights stripped and subject to whatever treatment that the white supremacists want to treat them to. So on one hand, we have to make sure that we're keeping ourselves out of the system willingly. And on the other hand, we can't in it unwillingly get ourselves caught up in the system as well. We have to do as much as we can to keep ourselves out of the system. Now, they have means outside of the system as well, but we're not going to compound our problems, right? So we're talking about, we're also talking about a reprogramming of the mindsets of the people within our community, right? Because there is a criminal element which does not represent the large majority of us, but there is also insanity that does represent the large majority of us that does contribute to the criminal element. The longer the insanity persists, the larger the criminality or the criminal elements grow, the larger those things grow. Because now we are black black people or the image of blackness or the, the definition of blackness has changed to the most hood, ratchet, and gangster and and street walking stuff you can think of. That's that's authentic blackness. The lowest rungs of our society are now seen as authentic blackness. So these are the contradictions in the system, educational systems that make us dumb, that they te that teach us not to think, welfare systems that keep us poor, foreign aid that keep our African nations in states of poverty, religious establishments which are going to send us all to hell, an enlightened constant and an and egalitarian constitution that maintains inequality. It is this system that is projected into and interpreted in the minds of black parents and black people that is also projected onto the socioeconomic structure that thereby creates attitudes, negative self, 
self-perceptions and frustrations. It is a kind of system that breeds mental problems, problems of criminality and other kinds of problems that are duly diagnosed by psychologists and sociologists and social workers that are duly treated by those who are helping professionals and ultimately end up helping themselves to us rather than helping us. As a matter of fact, we could see those professions as a part of the system itself. Our responses to these contradictions include problems with identity. Some of us respond through overcompensation. Those of us who are going to prove to the white folk that we are the greatest in the world. We see some people succeed as a result of failing. The success is often based on failure. Success can be a type of failure. That is one reason why often success does not bring the kind of personal satisfaction and peace that many people seek. And while often the individual, despite all of the material, the material evidences of having succeeded, still feels psychologically cheated because one can achieve for the wrong reasons. So when we achieve to prove to somebody else to show to show the white folk that we can do it as good as they can do it, it is a success that is still guaranteed to make us sick. It is motivated by the wrong reason. We must get caught up and we must get caught up in succeeding as a total way of life then we must get caught up in fearing failure and therefore become obsessive and compulsive. We must have a feeling of pressure, a feeling of imminent disaster, and a, a feeling of imminent disaster is pursuing us at all times. Therefore, success becomes a burden. And often we have to drink, smoke, and do all other unhealthy kinds of things in order to contend with it. We have the successful people cooking just as much as the unsuccessful because often they have succeeded and failed for the very same reason and their very success and failure helps to maintain the status quo. Are we studying Egyptology to prove to the white man how great we are and hope one day that when he acknowledges that Egyptians were Africans, that we will, that he will accept us as human beings? Is our study of Egyptology if, is our study of Egyptology a personal and collective defense mechanism, a means of dealing with our hurt pride, a means of trying to slip into the acceptance of white people by the back door? Is our hang up with history and the exaggeration of certain of our achievements means by which we try to salvage a damaged ego? There's a ache of inferiority that never goes away. And we study and we study and we read and we read and we learn the hieroglyphs and we still feel inferior because we are pushed by the wrong reasons. And when we are motivated by the wrong reasons, even though we may replace the people who rule over us, we will end up being just like them. He ain't lying. So I see this all the time. We have to be two times as good to be recognized. We have to be two times as good to be as good as them. We have to be two times as good. We have to work hard. We have to work harder than white people. We have to work hard for the recognition. And it's like, stop, stop searching for white acceptance and white recognition and stop comparing ourselves to white people. We don't have as much as the white people where well, we're not supposed to have as much as the white people. Do you not read history? Do you not know how we got here, right? We're supposed to have as much as we create for ourselves. And as of right now, we haven't created much. We haven't rebuilt. I would say we haven't rebuilt much because we created a lot in the past, but we haven't rebuilt much as a collective. There have been certain individuals who have created for themselves, but us, we haven't created much for ourselves. So we find ourselves often going into the white systems. Then we either go into the white systems and try to be the greatest in the white systems, or we go into the white systems and we're going to change the white people system. We're going to integrate these white people system. They're going to do what we say. And it's funny because I asked black people a question. If you started a corporation and it grew into a fortune 500 corporation, and it was a predominantly or all black, corporation would you allow white people specifically would you allow white women to come into your organization and whiten it up and and i'm asking this question to black women and they all give me an overwhelming hell no so if you can say if you can honestly say 
that you will not allow white women to come into your organization, your all black organization and whiten it up. Why do you think white people are giddy about allowing you to come into their all white organization and blacking it up? I know you thinking like the white guilt angle, but white people don't work off the white guilt angle like that. Not the mass of the, not the real white people, right? Not the white people that you think you're trying to go after for power, right? But the idea is we have to be accepted. We have to be better. Like whiteness is the, is the standard, is the measure for us in so many angles, in so many aspects of our lives. It's ridiculous. We don't even really know. We're, it's unconscious at this point. It's unconscious to the point to where we are just, we, we think it's normal to, to want to have white people celebrate us. Because when we want to be successful, we always find ourselves in white spaces. Think about that. But a reason, um, one great reason for that is white people have built the spaces. In the past, we've built the spaces, but we they've either been destroyed by white people, or we sold them off, or they just didn't work out. But we never rebuilt on a communal scale like we did in the past. And that's a problem. So we go into the white spaces expecting white people to accept us or wanting white people to accept us and working our butts off. We're going to kill ourselves working hard so white people can put us in these executive positions and we can blacken it up. I have to work two times as hard. I have to work three times as hard. Ain't nobody tell you to go work for them folk. I was succeeding for the wrong reasons, set our minds up for being inculcated and possessed by the very devil we fight against. And therefore, another revolution will have to be fought, and it will have to be fought against us. Consequently, it is not enough to succeed in our society or to fail. Some people succeed at failing, while the white man tells us we're, we're no good and we work very hard showing him he's right. Yes, we find the parallel situation in many parent-child situations. You will never be nothing. And the child shows them with the vengeance how it will be nothing. I'm going to make you see, mama, every day that I am nothing. I'm going to flaunt my nothingness in your face. I'm going to make you cry every night. I'm going to make you go to jail and try to get me out because you told me I was just like my daddy. No good. Going nowhere. Or else you will do it the other way. I'm going to show you how good I am. And he succeeds, but he succeeds with an emptiness in his heart and in his mind. Our victory leaves the taste of ashes in our mouths. We wonder why, we wonder where the happiness went. And we say, is this all there is to it? Nothing hurts like failing unless it is success. Many of us found out when we broke into the white mainstream America that there is just as much hell in there as it was when we began with. You know, we're, we're, we're literally working ourselves to the graves to be a part of something that doesn't ultimately want us there. You may have aspects that do, but ultimately white people don't really need us in those spaces the way we think they need us, right? They'll cherry pick the ones that they want. They'll cherry pick the ones that would benefit them. But for the most part, even those people have to go in there and work their butts off for the white man and, and work 10 times harder and deal with the microaggressions. Like I hear black people talking about, all these things that they deal in white America. But I'm like, but you want to be there. You want to be there. We would rather go deal with white people in their microaggressions and their racism and all these other things. That to us, let me show you, let me tell you where we are. To us, a better deal is going into white spaces and dealing with the racism and the white supremacy. Dealing with that is easier, is better than creating our own because we're afraid of the consequences of going against the system. So if you can't beat them, join them. That's the mentality, but not over here. We have to recognize then that it is not a matter of making it in the system, but a matter of questioning the system itself. It's not a matter of equality within the system, but the very critical looking at the system in of itself. So many of us and responding to the contradictions projected by this system react with rage, apathy, stereotype, stereotypy, paranoia, and suspiciousness 
and depression and mania and even uh bourgeois nationalism right oh yes we have some bourgeois nationalists here it is not only the ruling class whites that seek the and seek to perceive the condition of our people as a result of the moral failing of our people or some moral deficiency we have to be careful and make sure that we are as a people do not see ourselves that way yes we i mean yes and we as black nationalists well fed with jobs have to be very careful when we think the only thing our less fortunate brothers and sisters and it uh, needs is a lesson in Egypt history and a lesson in black history and a lesson in morality and voila. When all black people find out that we are great Egyptians and great Ghanaians, oh, what a great dream it will have to, it will have come, right? Then we will find out that we will be pretty much in the same condition we were in before. What we are fighting against, as Paul said in the Bible, are principalities against powers against the rulers against the darkness of this world against the spiritual wickedness in high places against a real power not just a mindset but against a real flesh and blood people who are in control of the world's socioeconomic system social system and military system more mere knowledge morality values through uh thought though of great importance are not going are not going to be enough to extra to extricate us from the situation that we're in so looking at a whole of where we are and how we got to where we are and even reintroducing and bringing back in that criminal mindset right the criminality of the black person right but he's looking at different angles of the conditioning well different ways the conditioning has affected us right the stereotypes the images the narratives that are put out about black people and then when we reinforce the stereotype so the criminal stereotype because looking at the crime statistics right how many black people work for white institutions or white corporations then they work for black institutions or black corporations i mean there was more so support every other racial groups businesses then we support our own we have we have statistics to prove that how we laud whiteness how we respect whiteness how we want to achieve whiteness how many black people want to live around white people how many black people want to be in white spaces how many black people want to go to the golf courses for the deals because we don't see it in ourselves we don't believe that we can do it for ourselves because if we believe we could do it for ourselves we would do it more especially on a on a grander scale now, I'm not saying that there aren't black people in America and around the globe who are doing the proper things that they need to make sure that we have something for ourselves or even that their critical mass has something for themselves. That is happening. I know it is happening because I've seen it. But if we're talking about a group of people who are going to change our fortunes, especially a group of people here in America who are going to change our fortunes for the mass of us, then the mass of us have to be willing to wake up and see what's going on. But you have to be willing to give up your luxuries. You have to be willing to change the way you exist. You have to be willing to throw off the mindset and actually be able to look at yourself and look at the flaws that you have as a black person and how, yes, and how you contribute to the maintenance and the continuance of the system of white supremacy. Even you, conscious brother number one, conscious sister number one, you have to look at yourself in the way that we go about our daily lives and how we still contribute to the system of white supremacy and how we contribute to our degradation and our downfall even unconsciously because of the program so dr Wilson's argument is the root of it is the programming the negro mindset that the white supremacists have gave us that's the that's dr Wilson's argument now in addition to that what i'm adding into that is we have to analyze our root cause and then go to change it. And changing the root cause means, means changing our mindset, changing the program, which I've been talking about every video of this, but it's analyzing what's actually happening to us, but being honest about it too. But being able to be honest, but have context with the honesty. Yes, in Tallahassee, Florida, black men constitute the highest percentage of people with the violent crimes. We're violent 
one of the reasons we're violent, one of the major reasons we're violent is because of the conditioning that we have received over the years. We have been conditioned to be violent people. We've been conditioned to be inferior. We've been conditioned to be people who hate ourselves. We've been conditioned to think that whiteness is the mark, the whiteness is the goal. Poverty, then you reintroduce, you introduce poverty, you introduce a lack of resources, you introduce the stressful situation, you introduce all the ills that you can think of into a community. And you think people are supposed to come out of this situation sane? No, they're supposed to come out with all types of issues. Why would somebody in one of the most horrid conditions, growing up in some of these conditions of lack, of poverty, of self-hate, of communal hate, trash is everywhere, flies is everywhere, roaches is everywhere. Like this, there's, there's desolence and, and destitution everywhere. There's no positivity anywhere. It's a miracle that some of these people do come out, that some black people do come out of these situations with a positive mindset, being able to, to, to do something with their lives. But a lot of times the problem with them is they're coming out with the mindset of, I need to assimilate into white culture to get out of this rather than I need to build something for my people. So now we're getting into the politics of diagnosis, right? We're talking about diagnosis and the relationship of mental health diagnosis to political and racial dogmatism. When social workers and sociologists do not begin with the political system, they become obsessed with diagnostic procedures. Psychology concerns itself with predicting behavior, with being able to determine the very fine extent of characteristics and the, and the symptomologies of various mental illnesses. Mental health disciplines concern themselves with the, cat, with the categorization of behavior and the means by which this process is carried out. Getting obsessively involved with the diagnostic procedures, psychologists and others in this area can deceive themselves into thinking that they are doing great scientific work and that they are politically neutral in their approach to life. Mental problems not only denote a disturbed psyche that an individual is, is disturbed, but that the individual disturbs our psyche. When we say an individual is disturbed, we not only indicate that the individual may have problems, but we indicate that we are having problems with the individual, that the individual is not only disturbed, but the individual disturbs us. So then, Diagnosis involves a dualistic relationship, not only in terms of what behavior is exhibited by the patient, but how that behavior reflects upon others and the persons who is making the diagnosis itself. And it exhibits and exposes the relationship between the person being diagnosed and the one being the diagnosis. Therefore, diagnosis is inherently social in nature whether it is being done by the psychiatrist, psychologist, sociologist, social worker, or anyone else. Being a social relationship, psychological diagnosis is a political affair. It is a part of the political system because we're talking about everyday human interactions, which is politics. So when we see an individual with a disturbed psyche, the individual disturbs the, the individual disturbs our psyche and our mental equilibrium. It is the process of diagnosis. It, it is not only the imbalance of the, in, of the individual that we're looking at, but at the threat of our own mental balance. The individual then is not only disturbing to his own peace of mind, he is disturbing to our peace of mind. And in more ways than one, he is disturbing to our ways of doing things. Because the individual is still a part of this community. The individual is still a part of this collective, uh, whether a male adapted fracture collective, but the individual is still a part of this web, this connection of people. And we're all impacted by this person's mindsets. We don't realize how we impact each other with the mindset that we have. If my mindset is negative or disturbing and I'm around you all the time, you're going to get the effects of this disturbing mindset. I'm going to disturb your peace. And you may in turn start disturbing your own peace and other people's peace. And in turn, disturb my peace as well. How we think, how we feel, how we go about perceiving the world, how we interact with the world, it matters. 
not just to us, but those around us. We are connected way more than we think. So that is why it's imperative for us as the individual to be the greatest version of ourselves as much as possible and to try to help as many other people as possible as well. Because we are, we are connected no matter how individualistic that we try to exist, that we want to exist, we're still connected. We're still one. And what I do affects you. Me making this video will positively or negatively impact the people who are watching this video. Right? So if I was putting out ratchet stuff, if I was putting out negative stuff, you know how many people it would, it would impact and affect? In the same token as me putting out this type of information, how many people is it impacting or affecting in a positive way? How many people is it impacting and affecting in a negative way? Right? That that has that can be measured, but what we do know is there's an impact nevertheless. If I've only met you once in my life, there's been an impact. We gotta, we gotta understand that. When we talk about the so-called diagnosing of our people, it involves an analysis not only in the behavior of our people, but of the behavior of the society as a whole. And we must recognize this fact and face it up to as a people. Diagnosis then is not merely procedural or neutral. As we have said, it is a political, it is political to the core. It is a political act. Through diagnosis, the ruling society applies its ideological measures to the re, to the recalcitrant men, members of the society. It maintains through diagnosis the status quo, and most of all, through diagnosis, the society where that society is unjust justifies its repressions. Thus, when an individual is labeled in an unjust and unequal society and is labeled by the very people who maintains this injustice and inequality, then the very diagnostic process itself and the very labels attached the victims of that society are very are the very means by which the repression is carried out in that system. Consequently, those of us who are in the so-called helping professions and in the business of diagnosing other people's behavior must recognize the degree to which we are part of the progressive of the repressive mechanism of that system. Environment matters to to try to. Um, First of all, as a lay person, to try to diagnose somebody with something as a lay person, stop it. Yeah, that's not your profession. But also, as a professional, as Dr. Wilson is saying, to diagnose somebody without taking in all of the factors that will go into this person's diagnosis is 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 bad business. It's bad news. It's, you're not doing your job well because you have to take in all factors, and environmental factors matter. Certain environments produce certain behaviors, more, more so in abundance than others. Not saying that this is the absolute behavior pattern that's going to come out of this environment, but lower income, impoverished, drug infested communities where people don't have what they need and people are trying to survive. There's no structure. There's no code of conduct. There's barely love. There's only survival, 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 survival. Those those environments are going to produce more people who more who may engage in criminal behavior, survival behaviors, more so than an environment that that may uh, you grow up in and you have what you need. You've always had what you need. Now that doesn't mean that just because you grew up in an environment and you've always had what you need that you won't end up being a criminal. That's not what that means, but we know one environment is a lot more conducive than the other. Now, one environment is also more conducive of um, producing maybe violent crimes than the other. The other may be more conducive to producing white collar crimes or things like that. But both environments can produce criminals, right? Now, of course, we know one is more conducive than the other. Now, one is also... The, the lower income communities, the ghettos, the projects are more so black environments, environments where there's predominantly black people in these environments. And when we look at these environments throughout the nation, a lot of these environments have the ills, the violent ills that we're talking about. Right. But it's the environments that were created, a project 
we call the projects the projects because it was literally a project the ractopia when you when you stack a bunch of people on top of each other you take away all the main resources but give them the give them what they need to survive but take away all other resources and opportunities you take away that 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 drive for them to, to go out and get what they need and then they are also repressed suppressed depressed oppressed they don't have everything what they need but you're giving them government assistance so they're dependent upon you take away that drive take away that drive of self-sufficiency take away that drive of of we're going to make it not not just survival because the survival aspect is reinforced not the thriving aspect not the communal aspect and then we get more criminal environments we know this because it's been experiments that have created this and turned into this we know this and this is where dr wilson is getting at it's not a hundred percent our fault that we behave the way we behave but the percentage of it that is our fault that's up to us to reverse the behavior to change the programming because all black people don't exist this way all black people don't exist this way but we have more black people we have uh the percentage of black people who are growing that exist this way but also the the uh, the the number of the violence that comes from this small group of black people is what the media is hitting on but the media is taking that and they're running with it white america is taking that and they're running with it. they're creating the narratives they're constructing these narratives when we when we choose to exist in environments that are not conducive to our well-being when we choose to exist in environments that are more so conducive to our repression that are more so conducive to our stress that are more so conducive to us trying to appease to the white man trying to assimilate to the white man trying to be successful in the definition and the eyes and the means of the white man we're literally breaking ourselves down like we we would use the word we're out here grinding to grind means to wear down we're literally wearing ourselves down for white approval that we will never get because they don't have to give us approval even though we really 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 want it and we'll do anything like dr wilson laid out we're either going to be the greatest versions of ourselves to get white attention and white approval or we're going to be the worst versions of ourselves to get white attention and white approval but nevertheless we're going to go in one of these directions and the motivation is white approval which is not great because that white approval leads to that white dependency and that white dependency leads us well you know we have nothing so if they ever choose to snatch their resources away we will be we'll be messed up we have nothing if they ever choose to snatch their resources away so us understanding what happened to us is important but like Dr. Wilson stated, it's more than just collecting the information. It's being able to utilize the information in a realistic fashion. How can I use this information today to help myself? How can I use it tomorrow to help myself? It's more than just learning the history. It's wrapping the history around other interests, skill, earning, earning and learning skill sets, knowledge, know-how, putting all that together. Also, um, reprogram ourselves learning how to be better versions better black people learning um learning to set our own goals our own expectations outside of white supremacy not wanting to be a part of the white system being that radical being willing to build up for ourselves be with, being willing to to start from the bottom being willing to be strong we don't want white people to accept us we're going to make the world respect us by doing our own thing and becoming the greatest versions of ourselves that we dictate for ourselves remember the falsification of african consciousness is one of the things is us believing that this version of us is the version that's supposed that our ancestors is supposed to be proud of no they're not our ancestors would not be proud of a bunch of black people who want to be like white people 
we really think our ancestors are should be proud of us for being a part of white institutions and achieving within white institutions and not building nothing for ourselves the same ancestors who was able to build for themselves with with what little that they had they were the the idea that they would be proud of us because we are more closer to white people than we've ever been but we're still so far away that's that falsification of african consciousness our white dependency has left us vulnerable and now they've painted us as criminals they painted us as street walkers they painted us as lazy painted us as destitute they painted us as all of the negative attributes that you could paint to a human being they've been painted to black people and then, and then we've romanticized and glam, glamorized it because this is what authentic blackness is oh this is why they behave this way this is why they're so criminal because look at them all they know is criminal behavior well the environment that you gave us the way you keep reinforcing how we uh, you keep reinforcing the negative stereotypes you keep reinforcing the criminal the criminality or the idea of the criminal black person that keeps being reinforced by the white person by our enemy but then they turn around and say look at those criminals we are frankenstein's monster you made us into this now you shall reap what you sow but at the same time it is on us to lo no longer be frankenstein's monster to be liberated and become great black people in america Hey man, the falsification of African consciousness. Dr. Amos Wilson from page read from pages 80 to 97. From age from pages 80 to 97. Make sure you get your read on. Next video, we're picking up in part three, the political psychology of black consciousness. Oh, that's gonna be cool. That's gonna be cool. So make sure y'all tune in. Uh, like, comment, share this video. Make sure as many people get this information they need to know about Dr. Amos Wilson. If you haven't got your copy of the book the link is in the description so you can get your copy of the falsification of african consciousness and support on the shoulders of giants at the same time i love you all and make sure y'all catch the next video coming up